Good afternoon. Before I read our text this afternoon, I want to extend a thank you to Dr. Tab for an invitation to speak to you all here in chapel. I count it a great honor. Our text this afternoon is going to be taken from the book of John, so I invite you to turn to John, the fourth chapter. Once you get to John chapter 4, let's start in verse number 21 and read down to verse number 24. John chapter 4, verse 21 through 24. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. If you could pray with me, please. Great is your faithfulness, Father. And oh, how we need to taste of your faithfulness this afternoon. As we open up your word, I pray that you would help. Pray that you would help us to receive from your word. Pray that you would help me in the heralding of your word. And at the end of it, Father, I pray that you would, give, you would uh, gain much glory. So open up our eyes to behold wonderful things out of your word this afternoon. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you know, our theme this semester is making disciples near and far. Our text this afternoon wonderfully informs us of this theme. And it does so because it does a couple of things for us. It not only tells us why we make disciples, but it also gives us a description of the type of disciples that we are seeking to make. We need this. We need this description because all types of disciples are made all over the place. There's nothing particularly Christian about a disciple based off of the definition that a disciple is someone who adheres to and closely follows the teaching of another person or another way of life. By this definition, there are disciples of secularism all the way to disciples of Oprah. If we're going to get on board with making disciples near and far, it would behoove us to be not only clear about why we should be engaged in this task, It also should be clear to us what these disciples should look like. A construction crew doesn't set out to make an ambiguous building. They have a particular building in mind, and we would be less impressed if they set out to make a building that they could not describe. Our text is a sweet relief. It's sweet because it tells us what we need to see. We don't have to come up with our own description of a disciple. Our text today tells us that a disciple is a true worshiper of the Father. So if we are going to make disciples both near and far, our text tells us that we are looking to see true worshipers of the Father made both near and also far. I've already read to you my assigned text. What I would like to do this afternoon is zoom out a little bit into the entire chapter, and I would like for you to consider this story this afternoon underneath four headings. Give, gift, giver, and gather. The first heading, give, sets the stage for our story. Upon learning that the Pharisees heard that Jesus was Busying himself with our theme, making disciples, he relocated from Judea to Galilee. And verse number four says that he had to pass through Samaria. Geographically, this was the shortest route to take. But the events of the story may fill this phrase out for us. Jesus has had to. Might have been the fastest route according to his pre-Google Maps, But this two-day stop in Samaria, this two-day stop where 
we have a, in front of us a history and a making of a divine necessity in the story of redemptive history. We read that Jesus came to a town of Samaria where two prominent Old Testament figures had their jerseys lifted up to the rafters. The town Sychar was near the field that Jacob and his, had given to his son Joseph. Jacob apparently had a well there, and it was at this well where we see a beautiful snapshot of the uniqueness of Jesus. Think about how John opens up his gospel. He opens it up like no other. Matthew traces Jesus' lineage back to Abraham and David. Luke traces it back to Adam. Mark tells us that Jesus is the Son of God. John pulls the curtain back, as it were, and he shows us a picture of Christ that is simply stunning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. We see glory sitting beside Jacob's well because God in the flesh is sitting there tired from his journey. Fully God experiencing the limitation of being fully man. Has there ever been a well in all of creation that had such a privilege? Verse 4 calls us to behold our merciful and our faithful high priest. This merciful and faithful high priest was made like us in every single aspect except sin. Are you tired in here this afternoon? Jesus fills you. He's been tired too. Behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the king. He, the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity, wearied as he was from his journey, sitting beside the well. Apparently, Jesus got off to an early start because by the time he arrives at the well, it's about noon. And this early afternoon hour is going to introduce another character into the story. A nameless woman arrives at the well to draw water. All we know about her at this point is that she is from Samaria. Although wells in her time were a place of encounters, she happens to be by herself. Typically, a group of women would come to the well together, even in the morning or in the evening when it was a little bit cooler. This woman had no such companions. She doesn't come with her best friends when she comes to this well. She only comes with her bucket. Seemingly minding her own business as she set out to draw water, she is interrupted by a request. Jesus says to her in verse 7, give me a drink. Now, the natural explana explanation for this request is that in his weariness, Jesus is thirsty. And his disciples, who had gone off into the city to purchase food, didn't leave a bucket for their master to get a much-needed drink. So he asked this lone woman for a drink. Surprised, this woman from Samaria, Samaria asks a question that shines light on such a brazen request from this man. Verse number 9 says, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Now, to our ears, that might seem to be a little odd. But John, the author, fills us in on an important detail. Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Her question is weighed down by history. Why don't the Jews have any friendly associations with the Samaritans? Why aren't the Samaritans cool with the Jews? We had to take you back in history to 722 BC, where the king of Assyria captured Samaria and carried off the majority of the Israelites away into exile. He repopulated the land with a mixture of left behind Israelites and other foreign nations. The problem was that these foreign nations came with their false gods. Due to some very close encounters with lions, they sought not only to serve their own gods, but also to serve and add Yahweh to their pantheon of deities. Second Kings 17.33 tells us that they feared the Lord, but also served their own gods. 
after the manner of the nations from among whom they've been carried away. Now, how many of y'all know this afternoon that this type of syncretism would not be acceptable? If you add to this theological crisis the intermarriage that took place between the Israelites and these foreign nations, you come up with a mixed race of individuals called the Samaritans, whom the Jews considered to be unclean. After the Babylonian captivity, when Jews made their ways back to the land to rebuild the temple, the Samaritans were told in no uncertain terms whatsoever that they would not be allowed or welcome to help in the rebuilding of the temple. You couple this with the long history of hostility between the two groups that included slaughter and that included desecration, and it's easy to see why in Jesus' day the two groups segregated themselves from each other. Some Jews took it so far that they wouldn't even travel through Samaria to go back and forth between Galilee and Judea. They went the inverted extra mile by taking the longer route around Samaria. This woman's question to Jesus is indeed well-grounded. And yet, as well-grounded as her question might be, Jesus shows himself to be impervious to the social norms that his conversation has brought about. During his ministry, he regularly interacted with Samaritans, no doubt to the chagrin of his Jewish audience. Even in light of rejection, he rebuked his disciples for wanting to call fire down on the Samaritan village. He healed a Samaritan leper who alone, out of the 10 lepers that Jesus cleansed, turned around and gave thanks. Jesus turned around and said, we're not 10 cleansed, where are the nine? Was not one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner, this Samaritan? Jesus commended the compassionate Samaritan who, unlike the priest and the Levite, set forth the model of mercy and love to a man who fell prey to robbers on the road to Jericho. And now, here in our story, he blows past all cultural barriers and he asks, to share the same drinking vessel with not only a Samaritan, but also a woman. Here Jesus is coming up against another social no-no. Jesus was expected to uphold in honor. Jewish men were not to talk to women in public, and they certainly were not supposed to take this universal experience of thirst and turn it into a theological object lesson. What an example we have here in Jesus at the well. What an instance of culture bowing its knee to Christ, who is the quintessential example of engaging with the other and treating them like a person. Imagine what the church in America would be like today if she didn't follow the culture in Jim Crow segregation because she wanted to be like her Lord who initiated conversation with the other for their spiritual good. Imagine the type of witness the church would put on full display today in her pursuit of the other like her Lord instead of mimicking a world who is increasingly retreating to its ideological corners. Imagine. The Samaritan's woman, the Samaritan woman's question leads us to the second heading, which is gift. In verse number 10, Jesus doesn't even engage in the woman's question so that he can make his way to the heart of the matter. The, the woman, in essence and in ignorance, is asking the wrong question. And yet Jesus, in mercy, gives her the right answer. If you knew the gift of God, And who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Verses 10 through 15 tells us about the gift of God. We come to find out that there isn't a literal or a metaphorical well in all of the universe where this water can be found. It's living water. John continues his theme of misunderstanding in his gospel with the woman's response. Like Nicodemus, she doesn't get it. She doesn't understand what Jesus is saying. She is apparently still looking around for Jesus' bucket. In verse number 11, the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? 
In a climate where water was a prized possession, you can understand her desire to obtain this living water, but her next question betrays the fact that she doesn't even expect Jesus to be able to cash in on his promise. Verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob? I wonder how she might have recounted this story in her older years. Maybe she ended up as a grandmother and one day telling her grandchild this story, turning to him and saying, child, I actually asked him if he was greater than Jacob who gave us this well or who drunk from it himself. The implied answer to her question is, no, you are not greater than our father Jacob. He gave us this well. You don't even have a bucket. The explicit answer to her scriptures from the explicit answer to her, her question from the scriptures is yes, he is greater than your father Jacob. Even up to this point in the Gospel of John, we have already been wrecked by the fact that Jesus is greater than Jacob because he's God in the flesh. He's greater than Jacob because he, as the Lamb of God, is the new and perfect sacrifice who takes away the sins of the world. Her father, Jacob, added to the sin of the world that this land takes away. He's greater than Jacob because he is the true temple who is better than Jacob's ladder. He's greater than Jacob because while Jacob gave his descendants this well with water to quench their physical thirst, he did not provide for them water that will satisfy eternal thirst. Verse 13 and 14 says, Jesus says this, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty. I want you to pause for a second. What does that do to your soul this afternoon? We all in here know intimately well our need to drink often because like the land that is never satisfied with water, our natural thirst never says enough. Who is this that's offering to quench an even deeper thirst? How is it that anyone, even this Samaritan woman who gets this water that Jesus gives, experiences an eternal How is it in her soul she can experience a quenching of this eternal thirst and be eternally satisfied? I like how D.A. Carson put it. He says, the living water Jesus gives bans thirst forever. It bans it. It bans thirst forever in the one who drinks it. Question is why? Verse number 14 says, the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. Natural thirst points to our eternal spiritual thirst. Natural water points to the living waters of eternal life. Oh, would we cry out like this woman does in verse number 15 and say, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty again. Even though she still doesn't get it, would we be like her in recognizing our neediness of this water? And would we recognize the neediness of those that are near and far for this living water? You may be in here this afternoon thinking, I'm real thirsty right now. The semester has been one long hot desert and I'm, already, I'm only halfway through and I'm spiritually parched. Oh, the readiness of Jesus to give you living water. The readiness of our Lord to give you what you need. Later in John, we get clarity that the living water flowing out of the heart of the believer is the spirit who gives life. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Come to Jesus and ask anew for a fresh experience of his thirst-quenching spirit who is better than any binge drinking that this world may press to your lips. I wonder 
If this conversation between Jill and Aslan in the silver chair would be good for your soul, you might remember it. The lion asked, are you thirsty? I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I? Could, could I? W would you mind going away while I do, said Jill. The lion, the lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. I, I dare not come and drink, says Drill, Jill. Then you will die of thirst, says the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, says the lion. There is no other stream to quench this eternal thirst inside of a human heart. Let's cry out to our Lord in our thirstiness and say, Lord, give us this drink continually. Physical water brings about life. The water that Jesus gives brings about eternal life. And this eternal life is the gift of God symbolized by living water. Hasn't God the Father, due to nothing in us, graciously promised this much-needed gift of water? Against the backdrop of Jeremiah 2, verse number 13, with the appalled and the shocked heavens as a witness of the two evils of God's people, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. With that backdrop, consider Isaiah 12, verse number 3. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Let your mind go back to Isaiah 49.10 and let it go forward to Revelation 7.16. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst anymore. Be freshly amazed at the invitation in Isaiah 55.1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Be shell-shocked this afternoon at the promise in Revelation 21.6. He said, Jesus, it's done. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the waters of life. Jesus offered to the woman at the well and to us the gift of God, which is eternal life, which is like water to our parched souls. This next part of the story unpacks how much this Samaritan woman needed this water. And this leads us to the third heading, giver. And don't forget how Jesus answered the woman's first question back in verse number nine. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Verse number 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. I want you to zoom in on the phrase, if you knew who it is that is saying to you. The third heading gives us the identity of the giver of this living water. After the woman who still hasn't grasped who Jesus is and what he is offering asks for the water, Jesus gets uncomfortably close to her personal life. This is the side of Jesus that at times, if we are keeping it real, that we rather not deal with in certain seasons of life. Jesus not only isn't concerned with social expectations, he also blows through the barrier of personal space. He blows through it like a friend who talks too close to your face and you can tell what he had for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Jesus will not be kept at arm's length. He will get in your business, but he'll get in your business for good purposes. John 2, 24 to 25 tells us that Jesus knew all people. And that he needed no one to bear witness about humanity, for he himself knew what was in humanity. Like a, a parent that already knows the outcome, he's not about to tell the woman to do something to see if she's going to do it. No. Even though he knows what's in this woman, he compassionately goes deeper into her soul for her good. 
Verse 16 says, go, call your husband and come here. Now, this may seem like a simple request. Go get your husband, come on back. The woman answered, I have no husband. Thinking that the matter is closed, you can imagine how her heart dropped when Jesus' reply came back by saying, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one that you're with now is not your husband. You have said that which is true. I've been thinking about why Jesus might have gone here. Why this change of course to drive right into the heart of the matter? I wonder if Jesus knew, if I wonder if Jesus had, uh, knew he had to get this woman to see her real need so that he can move her from sir to savior. Once again, Carson is helpful here. He says, by this turn in the dialogue, Jesus is indicating that she has also misunderstood the true dimensions of her own need, the real nature of her self-confessed thirst. Her repeated visits to the well pointed to her repeated visits to a different well of broken relationships. Truly, if she knew who she was talking to, she would have seen that the water that it was offered to her would indeed keep her from having to go back and forth to this well of broken relationships. Jesus had to get her to recognize that. She just got a glimpse into the fact that there's something different about this man that she's encountered at the well. Now, her cards are on the table. and We get a glimpse into why she came to the well by herself. Not only is she an unclean Samaritan, she, is, she was immoral. She is so different from the clean-nosed Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and yet Jesus talked to both of them. The woman, who didn't seek out Jesus but was yet found by him, came to a conclusion on the matter. In verse number 15, she says, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. This perception comes with a change of subject. Maybe she wanted Jesus to back off of her a little bit, or maybe she wanted to to take an opportunity to engage in a safer topic of, of different points in religion. Either way around, Jesus indulges her. Verse 20, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Here, we see another major point of contention between the Jews and the Samaritans. Where is the right place to worship the Lord? The mountain that she's referring to in our passage is Mount Gerizim. This is the mountain where Moses commanded six tribes of Israel to pronounce blessings of obedience to the other six tribes of Israel who were standing on Mount Ebal, ready to pronounce the curses of disobedience. The Samaritans only held to the first five books of the Hebrew Scriptures. So according to their understanding, Gerizim was the place the Lord was to be worshipped. And therefore, they built a temple there. Instead of going to the temple in Jerusalem, they worshipped God on Mount Gerizim. The hostility over this matter still burned hot in Jesus' day, particularly since it was a Jewish high priest who destroyed the Samaritan temple. This was a serious inquiry. Since she had a prophet in front of her, she was quite interested in this important topic. Jesus answers her in three parts. He says, one, the location of worship is changing. Verse number 21, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. I want you to notice that it isn't a question about the validity or the object of worship. The Father will be worshipped. He will be reverenced because that is the most right action in the entire universe in light of who he is. According to Revelation 4.11, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. 
Psalm 29, verse 2, ascribe to the Lord the glory that's due to his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The question is location. Where will this God of majestic worth be worshipped? Jesus unpacks for the woman that there is a change in location. In that hour, the temple won't be found on Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem. On both sites, there'll be a big sign that says we moved because the new temple where God is worshiped is Jesus. Second, Jesus informs a Samaritan woman that her and her people's worship is a misinformed worship. Verse number 22, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. Because the Samaritans held only to the Pentateuch for their worship, Though probably quite genuine in their eyes, they were genuinely wrong. How good is it that Jesus doesn't allow us to continue in misinformed worship? How can the Father be truly worshipped by a perverted worship? Pray that the Spirit would grant us boldness in our witnessing. And when we converse with people, we tell them in love and point them as Jesus pointed them to a misinformed worship they may be given. The Lord was pleased to make himself known to the Jews, and it is from them that the Savior of the world came. Third, Jesus corrects her misinformed worship, but then indicates a massive change. The Father will have that which he rightfully seeks. True worshipers who are not misinformed, according to verse 23 and verse 24. But the hour is coming and now is here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. This means that those who are true worshipers of the Father worship in accordance with who the Father is. He is spirit, and he is not flesh. He is of a different sort than the flesh, for his nature is spiritual. Unless one is born of water in spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And unless one worships the Father in spirit and in truth, he is not or she is not a true worshiper. He is not, a, he is not the worshiper that the Father is seeking. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Truth is found in the person and the work of Jesus. And it's only through him that the true worship of the Father can happen. Jesus can say to the woman that the hour is coming and is now here because he is there. The true worshiper was on the scene. He would do all that was necessary through his life, through his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, to ensure that the Father received his right worship, worship that is in spirit and in truth. I want you to notice how solid the ground is for this type of right worship. The Father will be worshiped in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Yes, the Father rightfully seeks that which no other created being ought to seek. And that which the Father seeks will be found because he will see to it. He will bring about true worshipers through the truth of his Son whom he sent in love and the work of his Spirit whom he empowered, who he promised in power. This is why we make disciples in obedience to Matthew 28. And this is the description of the disciples that we seek to make both near and far. We go and make disciples who are true worshipers because the Father is seeking for such disciples. We're on mission, but not our own mission. We get the ridiculous privilege of joining with the triune God on their mission to make true worshipers. Somebody said it like this. You might be able to let me know who it was. He said it somewhere. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. 
Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. Worship, therefore, is the fuel and the goal of missions. I want you to listen to the woman's response in verse number 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. The identity of the giver is the Christ, who at the end of our chapter is lauded by the Samaritans that listened to the testimony of this woman, heard him speak, and turn around and say, we now know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. He told us what true worship is. In closing, the last heading is then gather. This is my application point from this sermon. The rest of this story is, is worthy of another sermon. Jesus' disciples come back, and to their surprise, not only is he talking to this woman, but apparently he's already procured for himself some food to eat. His food is to do the will of him who sent him and to accomplish his work of making true worshipers. He once again looks to the physical to teach a spiritual truth. While physical crops needed some time to grow, now that he was on the scene, spiritual crops and the spiritual harvest of true wor worshipers are now being gathered into the kingdom. Maybe as the Samaritan crowd approached him, maybe he turned to his disciples and said, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes. See that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit, fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you entered into their labor. So go therefore Bethlehem College and Seminary on mission and make disciples near and far who are true worshipers. Go and gather in the fruit that is ripe for the harvest. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your son who tells us the truth. Thank you for sending your son who has done all that is necessary to bring about disciples who are true worshipers of you. Father, would we marvel in the mercy poured out on us and the fact that we can be true worshipers. Would you get glory out of our lives? Would you get glory out of our lives, Father, and would you grant us much grace to go and make disciples who are true worshipers of you, who worship you in spirit and truth? Grant us much grace and much help and much boldness. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.